I have known you for years and you uh, there are many different roles and organisations and skills that have brought you to the kitty list today. Just just run me through all of those. Yeah, absolutely, Alison. So I ended up a little bit in real estate by by accident, really, to be honest. So uh, I did geography at university originally and I specialised in like man's impact on the environment. And essentially a lot of the things that we think about as sort of sustainability today was what I studied as a as a degree. Mm-hmm. And when it came to, to finishing, I wanted to do something that combined like analytical skills with a bit of creative as well. And so I thought, maybe I'll go off and do something like marketing looks really glamorous. I'll go and work for L'Oreal or something like that. But um, ended up applying for the Barclays graduate scheme and getting accepted. And when I turned up, I absolutely loved it. And so I started at Barclays and I'd been in Barclays for about six months um, when I noticed this team and they looked really cool. They used to walk down the office all together. They were really busy. They did all the high profile deals. And I thought really fancy being part of that team. And um, and actually I was approached by the head of it and it was the structured real estate team. And so very quickly on joining the bank, I ended up in real estate and specifically real estate debt. Um, and I spent seven years at, at Barclays doing lots of different real estate roles, but working my way up really from sort of senior lending, straightforward to sort of RCFs and corporate facilities up into club facilities. And then we did a bit of mezzanine finance as well. And, uh, and my last role there was that we set up a specialist real estate team, which was basically to do um, things that the bank didn't fit the usual bank mandate, but where we had clients that we wanted to support. So where we could think outside the box and we got given a completely blank sheet of paper by credit, which was really exciting. Um, So from Barclays, then I moved to do pure mezzanine finance and I went to work for a company in London called DRC Capital. Ah, yes, yes. And DRC is a private debt fund. So all they do is debt, all they do is real estate um, and they do it in the UK and Europe. And I did predominantly mezzanine debt there, but did do some stretchy, stretchy senior too. Um, And I'd had a a client, um, both actually they were a client at Barclays and then lastly a client at, at DRC. Um, and they were in the process of buying a non-performing loan portfolio. And they asked me if I would come in, run the non-performing loan portfolio, look for other portfolios, and really sort of run the indirect sort of real estate investments business. And they were a private equity house called Harwood. Um, And so when they approached me, I thought, um, I've always wanted to be client side. Um, I feel like when on the debt side, I see just a sliver of what's going on and I actually want to see sort of the whole bigger picture. So I went across to that also to prove to myself that I'd done lots of sales of sort of structuring, going in to talk to people and saying, I can solve all your problems on the debt side. And I thought it would be interesting to go and have the difficult discussions that I didn't really want to have, I knew didn't come very naturally, but to prove almost to myself that I could go in and and sort of have those those conversations. So I worked at Harwood for about four years. We did, um, to start with, it was purely working on the uh, on the non-performing loans. So yeah, having horrible conversations of calling people up and telling them that we were calling their loan in, that it needed to be repaid. And I tried to always do it um, in a way so I could sleep at night. So to try and be as fair as possible whilst also remembering I'd got investors that I was, that I was returning for too. Um, I also did their all of their banking facilities when they bought new portfolios of properties. So I put debt in alongside sort of new acquisitions. And then we had a residential portfolio and we wanted to um, we wanted to grow that. And we saw an opportunity in the market where um, investors were starting to think about rental products. We already had a portfolio that rented and we knew there was appetite um, for that sort of investment. So we wanted to grow it. Um, expand it and list it as a REIT. Mm-hmm. And so I ran the REIT process through that. So I worked with the brokers to um, to put all of the documentation in place. Um, so sort of really sort of ran the process with, with your legal teams actually as well, Alison, who did an amazing job um, to get it all in place. And, and it really was an investment proposition that the investors were excited about. 
But when we launched it, um, uh, it was like a couple of days after we launched it, Mark Carney announced that the whole world was going to end, that we were never going to recover from Brexit. <laughs> and all of the investors <laughs> shut their books. And it was just the most awful thing to go through, to have and something when that... You look at the scramble for residential products now. Now! Just... Mm -hmm. I know, I know. Maybe we were just slightly, maybe we were slightly too early. Um, and so we had to pull it in the end. Um, but but out of that came good things because Harworth, um, who are the current company that I work for, are a listed um, entities listed on the main market, the stock exchange. Harworth were looking for a CFO. And um, and I got approached for the role and um, and I've now been in post for about 18 months. So Harworth originally spun out of UK Coal. Um, so uh, when UK Coal went into administration for the pension fund, they looked at where the assets of the business were and they pulled them all into one entity, which became Harworth. And the property assets were a combination of some agricultural lands, some industrial estates, and then a lot of coal mines, <laughs> some of which were still working. Um, and our old CEO was told to dispose of it all, recover the assets. But he, he went back and he said, well, what if we could do something a little bit longer term, but it would create more value? Is that something that you would consider? And he got sign off for it. So we started to transform these coal mines into new housing and new logistics communities. And that's really what we do today. So we've now bought other brownfield land sites like Ironbridge Power Station, um, old fa tractor factory site. Mm -hmm. We also own some suburban sort of greenfield sites as well. But what we do is we take them through the planning process, we master plan the, um, the schemes, and then we put in place the infrastructure so that we can deliver service plots out to the house builders or to end commercial occupiers. We'll do a bit of commercial building as well. And for us, it's very much about doing business in the right way. Mm -hmm. So it's no good with big schemes like that. If you're delivering sort of 3,000 homes, 3 million square feet of commercial space, you can't be in out just taking your profit and not worrying about what it's about. You, you're in it for a long run. You're sort of the custodian of the site and it's up to you to make sure that it's a sustainable place that will still be sort of thriving in, in sort of 50 years to come. So. That's very much the, the way that we operate is with a long term investment horizon. So it's quite clear that every time you've moved, you've moved and you talked about stretchy finance, you've actually stretched yourself. So yes. you've made <laughs> lots of changes to yourself along the way. What are the other changes you've observed and that what more would you do not to yourself, to others? Yeah, def they definitely have been stretchy changes. I was reflecting on on that the other day as well, Alison, and they need to be a bit brave in some of those moves. Um, you know, this current one, I've never been a CFO before. So sort of taking something like that sort of on was was a big step forward. But I have I have seen change in, in all of the organisations. I think I've been lucky to work for, for organisations that um, that on the whole have been sort of very, very fair. Um, but in particular, to see the changes that we've got at Harworth now, even over the course of the last 12 months, the board has changed a lot. Mm -hmm. So I've got a new CEO who's um, who's a woman and, um, mm -hmm. and we've now got more women on the board than, um, than we have men. So that's really unusual for a real estate uh, company. Uh, unique, I think. Yeah, and, um, and very exciting. Well, I think... Um, I think uh, aside from Granger, we're the only CEO CFO female combination in um, in the mar in the in the certainly in the listed space anyway. Yeah. Um, I think the other big change that I've seen over the years is in relation to um, ESG. It moving from becoming just a buzzword to us into being sort of much more the way that we can do business, and I think that's really exciting for for everyone. So there's a certain sense that it's being driven by the investors, but actually. What we're finding when we engage within the company is that people are really passionate about sort of doing something every day that makes a difference and doing it in the right way. And ultimately, for me, that's the core of ESG. Are you thinking long term and are you doing business in, in the right way? And we're partly lucky with what our business is, that it's so inherent within it. But I think um, I think that's exciting sort of across the board and it's um, and it's really sort of coming to the fore in, in real estate now as well. Well, I suppose the thing is, because some of what your business has been doing is repairing some of the damage yeah. from the past. But in actual fact, it's a bit like the net gain argument. It's about 
and making it better. So it's, it's, yes. it's enhancing it all. What are you most proud of in your career so far? I think, um, I think I'm probably most proud of having sort of got to where I am now, Alison. I think, I think coming out of that, um, not being able to do the listing at Harwood, that was a really tough time for me personally. I think I felt a felt real sense of sort of failure when you've put your heart and soul into into a project and it and it doesn't come off. Um, and there's nothing you could have done. You couldn't have worked any harder. Yeah. You've got sort of nothing to blame. Um, I was I was really in a really sort of dark spot after that. But to to construct something so positive out of it with Harworth, I'm really proud actually of having come through that and um, and being in a stronger place out out the other side. Um, uh, it, it sort of it wasn't easy, so so yeah, that's definitely something that I feel proud of. You said everybody talks about resilience. You've you've talked about being at Harworth for 16, 18 months. Yeah, of course, twelve of that has been working from home. I've just realised that. I know, I know. It's so mad. It's so mad. So um, yeah, twelve of that sort of working from home, and um, and I was only in a couple of months before my CEO resigned <laughs> as well. So knowing changes on the way so it has yeah it has definitely been a, a challenge we're, we're lucky we actually we were set up recently well so we had teams all ready to go because we've got teams in sort of Sheffield Manchester and, and Birmingham so we were well sort of set up but even so it's hard to form those relationships and you know like with with the banks and trying to get them to works with us through COVID. We managed to get another sort of 30 million facilities to help us to take advantage of opportunities, but you're doing everything sort of remotely. Whereas you were just usually just going, I don't know, have a coffee and sit down and work it all through, wouldn't you? So different. So what next for you is probably actually getting through the year end, but what next next? Yeah, so we've got, um, so with, with Linda coming in at the back end of last year, so our, our new CEO, we're um, we're really looking at how we can grow Harworth as a business. So we do brilliant things. We've got a great team. How can we do more of that? And where can we take the business? So so that's really what's next. Um, it, and I think it's really exciting sort of to see what we can do under under a new leadership team um, as well. So. so it won't be. We're not talking about a radical change. Not suddenly going to start buying shopping centres or, or anything like that. But um, uh, but but sort of looking at how we can take the path on the next leg of its journey. Um, so so that's definitely sort of what's next. And so what has been your best lockdown purchase if it's not going to be a shopping centre? Oh, so uh, I get get the Mickey taken out of me so much for this, Alison, because I was on a, a call with. Um, a group of um well they're friends really but we met through sort of a networking thing at work and somebody said oh what's the best lockdown purchase and everyone was joking about theirs and mine has definitely actually bought some fields around my some house fields. <laughs> which sounds crazy um but has, has been great cause we've had somewhere to walk <laughs> over the that's last fantastic <laughs> That's, a, that's sort of a version of direct action, isn't it? <laughs> it is, isn't it? Best answer, it's best extreme. answer. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I know you've got a lot on. Um, uh, fascinating. We'll watch your career and hopefully be a part of it as you go on. So thank you for that. Thank you, Kitty. Bye. Bye.